Our next speaker um, who's uh, coming up is uh, Mr. Kurt Mosley, who's Vice President for Strategic Alliances with Merritt Hawkins, which Merritt Hawkins is a uh, physician employment agency, if you will. Um, and just to let you know, they're one of the sponsors of the summit, just so that there's no undeclared conflicts of interest here. Mr. Mosley serves as Vice President of Strategic Alliances, as I said, um, of AMN Healthcare, the innovator in uh, health care workforce solutions with 20 years of staffing experience. Uh, Mr. Mosley is a leading authority on medical staffing trends, has been cited for his expertise in numerous publications, including USA Today, World Report, et cetera, uh, and medical economics. Um, he's worked with the healthcare-based experts at the University of Pennsylvania and dedicated to finding solutions. He served as a contributing editor to uh, the, the book, Will the Last Physician in America Please Turn Off the Lights? Um, in addition, Mr. Mosley has keynoted healthcare staffing roundtables for the U.S. Army and the American Society of Healthcare Journalists. He currently resides in uh, Dallas, Texas, and he's going to present medical practice in America, past, present, and future. Mr. Mosley? Great. Thank you. Dr. Wax, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, um, first of all, my wife hears those every once in a while, and she gets really excited, and my dad hears it, and he believes about half of it, so we'll leave it at that, okay? But again, thank you for the kind introduction. Most importantly, thank you for inviting us. Let us share in really this important, uh, I think, summit, and thanks to all the summit organizers, physicians, and everybody involved, because I think this is the right way to go forward. Yogi Berra said it the best. He said, we talked about a message earlier today. He said, um, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And this really has to focus out of what's going on today and where we're going. But I want to talk to you a little bit about the past, America, the future, and where healthcare I think is going, because it's very different in America. We've seen that in the last couple of years, and what's happened in America is just, uh, it's very different. So without further ado, we'll talk about the past, not such a glorious past, sadly, in, in American medical history. But again, we had to learn. We failed our way along, just like we have with every other thing. And think about one thing. We think about how the rapid growth in healthcare in America is. Let me think about two dates for you, 1903 and 1969. Ring a bell for anybody? Anything? 66 years, right? See how good I am on the math? But that's also, think about the first flight, okay? Wright Brothers' first flight in 1969, walking on the moon. Medicine caught up quickly, just how we transmit in aeronautics. Think about how quick we developed. The present, what we do in healthcare in America is unbelievable. I'm so proud of it. And I come to you today, not from the doctor standpoint. I know the, my tag, that's why I didn't wear it. It's a doctor. I'm, not, I'm Kurt Mosley, not a doctor. So I come to you from the patient side today. And it's a very different uh, perspective. My father used to say this. He said, you know, all of us are going to be patients. And I think we all know that. And he also told me, he said, he was a real brilliant man. He said, nobody's going to get out of this thing alive, Kurt. So act accordingly. So again, as we see that as we change, that what we're doing in America, say what you will about World Health Organization, we have more centenarians than any country in the world. Everybody aware of that? Just show of hands. I don't call on anybody. We have 57,000 centenarians. Next closest country is what? Japan at 51,000. It's incredible what we do here. And again, you would think China and Japan, or China and uh, India just for sheer numbers, but we do so much in America. Tu Gawande writes in his book, The Checklist Manifesto. Anybody read that? Great book. He talks about what the situation is. We can save a patient's life 12,000 different ways. So we're doing phenomenal things. Then the future. You've got to be honest with me. Who watches or with their children? Who watches the Big Bang Theory? Show of hands. Okay. Remember Sheldon and the virtual presence device? We're doing that nowadays. We're doing phenomenal things. We're doing things we never thought of. And again, people always say, well, healthcare is here today, yes. Is the future here? Yes. Are different things happening? Yes. I'm a non-objective first-time grandfather. My year-and-a-half-old grandson, who I love to death, a good friend of mine, works for Huggies. And he said, boy, the future of medicine's here, especially with monitoring. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, try this. Have you ever heard of Tweet P before? You know, tweet like tweet, like a Twitter, and then P? It's a sensor you put on the outside of the diaper. It's not a joke. And when it detects moisture, it texts you. Think about it. And again, when I did it, I get it on my phone. And so what I do is I text my wife and say, change your grandson's diaper. Yeah. 
But just think, we can do that with patients now. Ford is building cars for heart patients when they ha uh, put their hands on the steering wheels every day. What happens? So again, they actually can te uh, test their pulse, their heart rate. So we're doing so many phenomenal things. But again, as we look at it, is this the future of healthcare? Is this the first? The, I mean, I guess I would say, is this the doctor of the future? Remember, who, who watched Star Trek? Come on, you got to be honest. Okay, that's Bones, right? Well, this is the guy, or is it this? You ever remember this? You remember this, the tricorder? Yeah, there you go. Again, ran up town, everything was fine, looked at it. Well, you have this, 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 and this. How far away from you, that? We're real close. Qualcomm came out with a tricorder X prize, which is very close. And they have three finalists. And these three finalists, these iPad-sized devices, can detect can some cancers non-invasively. If you have a virus, in fact, I know some of you had children in the room, this virus, it'll detect it. You know, they always say during the flu season, I'm supposed to come home, everybody has the flu, I'm not supposed to go back to school. Run up down there, you go back to school, you don't have the virus. There's three companies now. One thing I do not agree with, and I don't read the slides, but I want to read this, where it says, we envision a future where healthcare diagnosis is in a way it's more accurate, more accessible, and more understandable than today's doctors? I think not. We have devices in America that can help people save lives, live longer. Again, as we talked about it, we have more centenarians in any country. Okay? Right now, that 57,000 will grow in 2030 to a quarter of a million people living over the age of 100. Hopefully not driving next to you down the road, right? But who's going to take care of them? We're doing that, which is great. But at the same time, we can't forget you, the doctor. And I think that's what's happened. And again, before we go forward, let's go back a little bit to this stage one of this heroic medicine. And Dr. Benjamin Rush was ahead of it. He signed the Declaration of Independence. But we saw what we were doing back then. Midwives, herbalists, patients, they provide their own care. Hospitals, in some cases, what happened? Well, they were there. Sometimes people just went there to pass away. But again, physicians were reserved for these heroic cases. And what were they? Well, bloodletting. Everybody remember this? Okay. What was unique about bloodletting back then, ladies and gentlemen, is that we would let blood out of a human body because we thought if they were sick, something was bad there. And what was unique, we let out you know, two pints of blood or a pint of blood. And we'd always say back at the time, and again, I'm not a physician. This is just the history that I've been involved with. We would say, boy, if they had bad blood inside of them, we let two pints of blood out. Only the bad blood will leave. The good blood will stay in. We just goofed. We didn't know. Again, I think Yogi Berra said it the best. He goes, making predictions is really, really tough, right? Especially about the future. We just didn't know. And again, when we look at what happened, back then, the person that did bloodletting to you also did what? Sometimes pulled your teeth out. Sometimes what else? Cut your hair. That's where the barber pole came out of. Those were the rags drying outside. So what are these heroic measures? Very unique. And again, the whole urge to purge. Somebody was sick, get it out of them. Okay. And again, we know right now we made mistakes. But again, we made we correct them so much quicker. And then also, what a, surgery was sharp, brutal, occasionally effective. If you remember back in 1890, Dr. Alice McGaw or Alice McGaw under Dr. Mayo. First CRNA, first time we ever did any anesthetic procedures in America. So we had to learn. We had to learn quickly. And why? Well, because we had to get better. Tylenol now, we, but everybody say Tylenol is probably our number one you know, drug that we, not drug, I guess it is drug, excuse me, that we apply for getting well. Anybody know what the number one drug was back then? Calomel. Anybody heard of Calomel? Okay. A little story about Calomel is very interesting. George Washington, after he was served as the president of our country, um, he was going around Mount Vernon, taking marking trees to be removed. You may know that Mount Vernon was the largest whiskey distillery at the time in America. And he came in, he was very prompt, and he was a big guy. He was like, my size, I'm not bigger. And he was a big guy, and he came in late for dinner. He had been out in the rain and the snow and the sleet. He didn't want to be late for dinner, so he sat down. Martha says, do you want to take your time? He said, no, I don't want to, uh, my dinner guest kept his wet clothes on. The next day he woke up with strep throat that actually became pneumonia. Ever heard about this? This is not a wives' tale. So what they did, they brought in his doctors, and they said, it's very unique. Uh, let's blood let two pints of blood. So they did. They gave him a tartar, uh, like a tartar endemic is what it was called, to induce vomiting. They put a molasses mixture together. It almost caused him to choke to death because his throat was so inflamed. And then as he went along, 
The next day, he got worse. They bloodlet another two pints of blood. So he was down four of the 10 or 11, I guess, you know. Again, I'm not a physician, but I think we have about 10 pints. And then, sadly, they gave him calomel. Anybody know what the active ingredient in calomel is? Mercury. Sadly, that was that hastened his demise. He died that evening. And I'm not saying this is, it was a conspiracy, but we just didn't know. And we had to get better. So what did we do? Well, we looked at it from the standpoint it was the same uh, uh, effort as prescribing methamphetamine. We just didn't know. So we started training doctors by the apprentice system. And this was way back, way back. And again, if you had a good doctor training, you became a good doctor. It was just the way it was. But again, these doctors were trained through the apprentice system. And it got better. And again, we tried to get better. We tried to go to our next level. And then medicine, this whole stage two, medicine was a trade. Medical Society in New Jersey was the first one that actually used, guess what? Evidence-based medicine. And a growing number of these medical societies developed their own training programs in these proprietary schools. And what were the proprietary schools about? Well, the more doctors you train, the more money you got. So again, more diplomas that were out there. At one time, ladies and gentlemen, in America, 400 medical schools in America. We have about, give or take, about 130 right now, something like that. But what happened? Well, these medical schools, a lot of them weren't good. They were doing faith healing, seances. We weren't training medicine right. So we brought in Abraham Flexner. Have you heard of Flexner, to show of hands? Pre-Flexner, post-Flexner. He wasn't in medicine. He was an academician. He knew education. And he came out and he says, oh, my gosh, we need to get better. So he went to all the medical schools, found out they were, some of them were unsanitary, they weren't run right. And his recommendations to the Carnegie Foundation were what? Well, close every, all but 66 medical schools. And the proprietary schools, the ones we could go in if you had money, you could become a physician, they were closed. We were on the right steps. But when we did this, inadvertently, we stopped women from going into medicine because the schools were smaller. But we started board certification. We started on the track of evidence-based medicine. Anybody know what the first four were? Anybody take a guess? Certifications? OBGYN, not that unique. Okay. Ophthalmology, otolaryngology, dermatology. Board, FP was not even a board certified specialty until 1969. So we were getting better. And as we go along here, and I know I'm keeping pace here because I sure don't, I want to make sure we have your questions. But as we go along and we're getting quicker now, what's happening, we went to this whole age of specialization. A good friend of mine, I uh, won't mention, he was in California. He was a CEO of a hospital. He had a little sign on his desk that said he retires with the most cardiologist wins. Because at the time, you know, everything was funding through that, and the cardiologist put a lot of ho put money in the hospital. But this whole age of specialization happened. And then, as we talked earlier, so unique to develop a slide deck and come here and talk to you when everybody else is talking about the same thing. But now we have 200 board certified specialties in America. After World War II, we had 11. So we've gotten so specialized in America, which is good. That's why I think in a lot of cases we're living longer. Fee for service happened. You heard this earlier. That's Sidney Garfield. He worked with Henry Kaiser, right, to develop the first HMO. Took a nickel out of paychecks every day. Because what was happening? They had to build ships during World War II, right? Through the Kaiser Foundation, through the Kaiser shipyards. And again, they didn't have the most healthy people because most all the people that were actually, you know, healthy, able-bodied men were in the war. And then afterwards, after the war, what happened? Well, obviously the men came back in, but they said, boy, we're sure making a lot of money at this health insurance industry. And what happened? His wife, Kaiser's wife, loved this uh, part of their land in Cupertino called Permanente Creek. Anybody heard about that? So the Permanente Medical Group started, and guess what we had? Kaiser Permanente. 1990, the largest HMO in America from a large industrial uh, commodity. So things change, and things change rapidly. What else changed? Well, the hospital was in a workshop. All the doctors worked there. Back when I was young, back when the earth was still cooling, a long time ago, my pediatrician's office was about 40 yards from where I was born. When you went to the doctor, you went to the medical office building in the hospital. But that's changed. It's changed dramatically. But doctors worked in the hospital, and they provided scientific knowledge. Patient referrals in the hospital provided space, equipment, right? What else? Hospitals were run to help the doctors run those. And again, what really happened? This whole issue. Years ago, I used to do a presentation. It was called Doctors of Mars, Administrators of Venus, you know, about the whole issue. 
And what happened? The workshop became a great environment, but things had to change, right? Then everything turned upside down. And forgive me, I always forget this. Is it, uh, it's one human year for every seven dog years, is that right? Is that what, right? Something like that? And uh, the last three years in healthcare, three or four years, things have changed 30 years. Because you go back to 1965, what was Medicare and Medicaid? It was an insurance plan. Does anybody remember the Health Security Act? Hillary Care, it was called the Health Security Act. That was another insurance act. But what was unique about both of those, ladies and gentlemen? What was unique is that they were insurance plans, but neither of them dealt with the fact they could tell doctors how to practice medicine. One would argue the ACA does, every cost-cutting, control method. So what changed overnight? Everything, just dramatically. And again, what's also unique is that we see everything turned upside down. Have you seen this picture before? The bridge at Cholteca, Honduras. Somebody said, give us a picture of what's going on in healthcare and how it's changing. Well, this was a beautiful arch bridge in Cholteca, Honduras. Back in the year 2000, a little thing called Hurricane Mitch came roaring through. In one 24-hour period, changed the river. The river moved. The river is where healthcare in America is right now. The mud is where the infrastructure is. The river moved. That's what's changing. And if you go on the website, what's unique, you go on the website of the Japanese company that built the bridge, they're very proud of it. And you look on their website and there's that picture and it says, our bridge survived Hurricane Mitch. They missed the point. The river moved. So, as we see this, as we change, and what really changed? Well, everything. We changed to this whole age of teamwork. Okay. What is it? Well, this whole team delivered concept, critical care management, medical home, where these heroic apprentices, the tradesperson specialist, the point guard, now they run the team. They dish off to other specialists. They communicate, they make others better. Paid on wins, not points. Let me say that again. Paid on wins, not points. That's very unique. That's your volume to value, right? We are going from heads on beds to no more heads on beds. Okay, paying on value. And again, there's a shortage of good ones. So this whole concept is changing. And as we change, I'm not saying this will happen, but this is what the ACA is dictating. Again, what's the value of a doctor today? Oops, let me back up again. Um, back up, how do I go back up? What's the value of a doctor today? I just want to take a quick look at this video. I think it's kind of unique if I can get back here. Go, thank you. Well, this is what in the past, again, as I talked about the uniqueness when my friend said, uh, he who retires with the most cardiologist wins. The value of a doctor. Let's take a look at this real quick. Do we have sound? You would want to have to ensure the success of your facility. If you set a qualified, loyal medical staff, go to the head of the class. By admitting patients, ordering tests, prescribing drugs, and performing procedures, physicians are essential to maintaining the all-important quality of care hospitals provide to their patients. They are also key to maintaining hospital financial viability. How essential? Consider the results of Merritt Hawkins' 2013 survey of physician inpatient outpatient revenue. This periodic survey quantifies how much revenue physicians in various specialties generate per year on behalf of their affiliated hospitals. Here are the top five specialties ranked by the annual average
Indiana Hospital Association. I showed him this about three years ago, and I wanted to bring it up because we're changing from this. But he said, Kurt, you really hit on the head. He said, the reality is, he said, without doctors, he said, our hospitals are empty hotels with a lot of expensive equipment. The key is with you. And not only that, the economic value which you bring in communities. Every, doc, every, person, every doctor that comes to a community, you bring 10 or 12 people with you to be employed. But what's changing? The inpatient revenue of the past may be changing to where not he who has the most physicians wins, but he who has the most doctors with the right behaviors in the right settings will win. That's where we're going as we look forward to the ACA. Our friends with the Physicians Foundation, they asked us back in 2008 to do a survey of doctors in America. We were very flattered. Um, we did one in 2008, 2012, and 2014. I want to talk to you about that survey today. This survey was sent out to two, or excuse me, 640,000 doctors. We had over 20,000 responses nationwide. And bear with me, of those 20,000 responses, we had 13,000 legible written responses from our doctors. Unbelievable information. One comment for our doctors, and I wish this was the minority. This so one doctor said, but the way we're going, healthcare is going to be like no different than sitting, digging a ditch with an overseer standing you over, over next to you. My concern for the future is to maintain that independence. But I want to talk to you about the survey itself. How is team morale? The good news is the survey, the 2014 survey, said that 44% of the physicians said the morale was negative, but that's actually down or better, say good, than it was in 2012, but still only 50% would recommend medicine in their career, as a career, a concern that we have. What else? We asked them what they were going to do. Okay. Cut, continue, continue as they are, excuse me. Cut back, but cut back on hours, retire, switch to concierge. I attended the American Academy of Private Practice. Unbelievable, it's a concierge group, and I heard one of the most incredible stories. I think I told it last night, so forgive me if anybody was talking to me. One doctor went to Africa on a medical mission. He was a concierge doctor. His patient didn't get the message that another doctor took over. She was in London. Okay. Called and said, listen, I got here a day early. I slept in a bad hotel. I think I have bed bugs. Well, he has a special iPhone 6 app. He shot it said, shoot your rash and I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay. She shot it. He looked at it and said, sent her back a text. He said, listen, you don't have bed bugs. You have shingles. She went, my God. He took her GPS location, called in a prescription 100 yards away from where she was in London. Two different continents. We can do this. But we have to get better at it. Work temporary. But ladies and gentlemen, what is this? Everything after, continue as they are, less access. At a time we need, guess what? More access. Politicians who I debate all the time, who pick, try to pick apart our, our study, as you mentioned, Dr. Wax, uh, with the last physician in America, please turn off the lights. We've had people say, well, you're a staffing firm. You're going to say there's a shortage. But everything we wrote about in 2002 came through today, sadly. But it's less access at the time we need more. What else? Well, changing work patterns. One of the politicians I talked to last week in DC alone, in fact, she told me, she, I shouldn't say that, that politician said, you know, Mr. Mills, I don't understand about this doctor shortage. Every day, every time I go to the doctor, I get in to see him the same day. Really, okay? Our politicians. So I was talking to her and I said, she goes, well, the same amount of doctors have been around for the last 10 years. 767 around there? Yes, absolutely. I said, well, what's the point? She goes, well, we don't see the number changing that much, so where's the shortage? Well, look at this. In our survey, the physicians are seeing 3% fewer patients they did in 2012. 6% fewer hours in 2008, and what else? 20% of their time on paperwork. A good friend of mine in Dallas just became an employee, as a physician employee. He said, I didn't understand how much paperwork I pushed on my subordinates. He said, every day for me is like April 14th through you, filling out your taxes. But what does this mean? It doesn't mean a lot in this state, but here is it is. 6% reduction in work hours, that's 44,000 full-time equivalent doctors lost. 3% fewer patients seen, 30 million patient encounters. Of the what? 1.3 billion patient encounters we have a year. And 20% of their time on paperwork, we lose 140,000 full-time equivalents. That's our point, that our doctors are changing and changing the way they practice. What do you think, huh? Slide, sell, slide earlier, took it from the same, different slide deck, but I won't go through that, but will they strike? There's talk, there's talk across the country. And what's the future? How are doctors going to cope? Well, I think most importantly, 
This whole cone of complexity, staffing is going to change. The whole compendium. Medical specialists, they're not necessarily on top, but they're going to have to do what they're trained to do. There won't be time. A good friend of mine is a cardiologist in Dallas. He part-time, yeah, we're not part-time, about 20% of his, his uh, medical practice is primary care. And I said, you won't be able to do that because we're going to need every specialist as we live longer. Primary care doctors, difference. Some of you people have been in 25 years, right? Primary care doctors used to do what? Castings, laparoscopic procedures, right? Um, in a lot of cases, sutures. It's different nowadays. So they're going to have to step up. What else? Pharmacists, they don't do, they don't actually diagnose, but they treat in some cases. PAs and nurse practitioners, I'll get into that in a second. We train them to hear. Sometimes we limit them to hear. We don't want them over extending over their training, but they'll be a part of this. All the way down to case managers. Uncoordinated care in America, ladies and gentlemen, $260 billion a year loss. And again, we are at the threshold. We are at the end. We have, guess what, $3 trillion we spend a year. That's the fifth richest country in the world. Of that $3 trillion, $1.5 trillion attributes to 5% of our patient population. We have to get better. And how does this all relate? Well, a nurse practitioners and PA is going to replace. And think about the ACA. What was it designed? It was designed that doctors don't practice efficiently, which I don't agree with, that once we start paying on quality, we won't need additional doctors. Since when did physicians not provide quality? And again, what else? Well, nurse practitioners and PAs are going to take over. Not really. Again, they're going to be a supplement. They're here now, but there's going to be a shortage of them. So again, as we go forward, staffing is going to be different, but again, it's still centered on the doctor. And the retail boom. You've heard about this, but again, retail is getting smart. As I speak across the country, you know, those outlets, those, uh, what do they call them, uh, retail outlets, every time you go to one, what do they have there? An urgent care center. That's where the patients are going. Number of visits uh, by 2020, pharmacy-based uh, retail, it's going to provide mostly uh, primary care service, all the primary care services. And what are they providing? Chronic care now. They're getting smart. They're repeat offenders. And... In Walgreens in California, you can actually get in on an app and contact your patient. And the doctors, we're going to see doc patients in different ways you are. How are those? Well, complexivist. Clement Beasel coined this idea where it's a doctor not taking care of patients but sitting in a critical care model home, medical home, coordinating care and making sure the patients get what they need. Not necessarily the patient care, that'll be the doctors, nurse practitioners, all the different people around that'll be supporting, but making sure their social environment is adequate. What else? Monitoring nutrition. We have to get better. We have to get better with our poverty patients in America because it's killing our costs. And three-year medical graduates now. Again, NYU, Texas Tech, Columbia. Texas Tech has a great concept. The actual last six months, you're in an office environment, a mock office environment, learning how to guess what? Work within an environment. Work within the hospital. Working how to do coding. Working with, guess what? Team care. Emotionally intelligent physicians. We're going to start testing. First MCATs. And why are we doing this? Patient satisfaction. Patient satisfaction is a huge part of this value-based system. But what did everybody affect, everybody, uh, excuse me, uh, really uh, not remember? with the ACA, it affects you, the patients, right? It's systems going from large con consolidated systems to small, or small to large, excuse me, a payment system turned upside down. We're not the volume of the work you're going to do, but the value is going to be paid. What else? Health information technology and the myriad of other electronics that you have to do because the ACA, what they forgot, you still have to provide quality on 1.3 billion patient visits, which you've always done. So again, is it going to change? Grand aides, they're going to be in support of our doctors. Anybody heard of grand aides before, just a show of hands? Okay. They're basically, uh, there's a lot of them in Dallas. I've uh, met with a couple of them. They go to the homes to make sure that the patients understand the medication. They understand what their environment is. Do they have cooling in the summer? Do they have heat in the winter? Story I heard last week from one of the grand aides I know. She said you went to a patient's house. He was doing better. He had some mental issues, but he was on medication. She said to him, this is great. Um, you're going to see the doctor tomorrow. You've taken all your medication. They're going to refill it tomorrow. The patient was very honest and said, you know what? I got behind on my medication, so I took all 12 to catch up. Okay. Say, called the ambulance, pumped the stomach, 
this is what we're going to have to do to control these costs. But again, allow physicians to focus on what? The physician-patient relationship. Everything I get when I, my company, when I get a prescription, they call me. I've gotten the same thing for years. Do you understand it, how to take it? This is a step toward reducing that uh, issue. Shared medical appointments for our chronic care. Anybody heard of these? Okay. New concept, catching on. I went to one. Um, I have this, it's 6 to 15 patients, 90 minutes. In a lot of cases, this is chronic care. It would take a doctor all day, but I went to one. I have exercise and asthma. I ride a bike. Sometimes about two miles in, I get asthma. It's really ridiculous. But I went to one, and I said, I walked in, and it was a big circle of chairs, and I sat down. You have to sign a HIPAA release, okay? So I sat down. They go, oh, we have somebody new today. And I go, you know, you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kurt. I have asthma. Hi, Kurt. Hi, Kurt. Went around the room, okay? And it was, it was like an AA meeting, but not that I've ever been to one, okay? But it was very unique. The doctor spent five minutes with me, but I felt better because there's other people there. Had the, I always see it feel like a freak because I get into sometimes these master races that I get in, I get asthma. And I had other people that had that, plus the PhD in pharmacy. And they don't diagnose, ladies and gentlemen. That's your job. But he came in and said, what are you taking, what are you taking, what are you taking? He signed a HIPAA release. Ten, or excuse me, seven of the 15 people in there were getting doubly medicated. I said, you better get with your doctors because you're getting two different medications for the same problem. And great patient satisfaction. What else? Robots are going to see us as I talked about. That's Gigi, a good friend of mine, was at Presbyterian, sadly, during Thomas Duncan. But Gigi actually is an ultraviolet light robot that went in and changed the Ebola virus, changed the DNA to where it's non-infective. And again, video conferencing, telepresence robots. And virtually trained surgeons, the future? Yes, absolutely. So we can start to train so we don't make mistakes. Haptic feedback, on, or haptic feedback for a lot of it. But we're getting so far ahead of ourselves, we can't forget about what? You, the doctor. And mobile apps. American Well is the first, what they call the first mobile triage. 49 bucks, 10 minutes with a doctor, shoot a picture of your sore throat. Okay. This is coming. But again, we still can't forget you, the physician. And do-it-yourself medicine, we talked about monitoring. This is great. My doctor helps me. He said, Kurt, if you long keep your blood work well, you don't have to see me, monitor. But he always talks to me after hours. Nobody pays him for that. I asked him, I said, you, what's a code for that? He said, we don't have one. We have to figure out how to do this because as we expand and the doctor shortage, more access to doctors, we're going to have to pay him for that. And we have to get back to eminence-based medicine. Not that we haven't. I don't want to be, feel bad, but let me tell you just a short story. I had a little bout with cancer. I went to the uh, surgeon. I said, what do you think? He said, surgery. So I went to the radiation oncologist. What do you think he said? Radiation. I went to my primary care physician. I said, what do you think? He said, I'd wait. I go, guys, I need something better than this. 33 and a third. I said, would you all... Get, sit down with me, or maybe get on a conference call. No, no, no. We have to get back to that. We have to do that quickly. And end of life care, is it changing? Yes. A lot of our costs are our end of life care. Denmark's an example. A lot of people said, listen, if I'm terminal, I want to die at home. And what happened when we changed SDR? Medicare is going to pay for end of life counseling starting January 1. So we're changing, and things will be changing with us. And ICD-10 is coming. Okay, and it's coming fast. Yeah, I love that. One th Think about this. ICD-9, 19,000 codes. ICD-10, 141,000, right? Very unique. I love it. Well, I love the fact. Um, when you look about it, there's 60 different codes. And this is not a joke, because this is research I've done. There's 60 different codes for running a foul. Should have been F-O-W-L. F-O-U-L. A bird's macaws, pigeons and crows, no joke. One code for bitten by a turtle. I presented to the Tennessee Primary Care Association, or Tennessee Medical Society. They said, don't make fun of that. We get bitten by turtles plenty in this state. Another code for burnt ball jet ski on fire, no joke. My favorite code, my favorite code. Hurt while playing a brass instrument, right? Okay. So, as we go forward, the real age of heroic medicine, it's what you do today. Targeted therapies. You know, I, I was on a panel with MD Anderson, president of MC, MD Anderson. He said, maybe 10 years chemotherapy will be a thing of the fast. It's too inefficient, too harmful. Bioprinters using what? Old bubble jet printers to print livers and kidneys. We're 10 years away. 
gene therapy, neuroprosthetics, new implants to treat Parkinson's patients. What was the first neuroprosthetic we did 40 years ago? Cochlear ear implants, remember? Smart helmets to tell players that they've been had a concussion. Mobile texting and uh, adjustable sensors, tweet P. One out of every three people in America born today will live over the age of 100. The first person to live to 130, ladies and gentlemen, they're here in America. I don't know who they are, but they're living here. We're living longer, which is good. But again, the real age of heroic medicine, it's not a tricorder. We've seen these before, polymerase machines. As we get quicker, faster, and these drop in costs, we'll be able to do this. But we can't forget the future is not going to include the doctor. It has to include the doctor. Because this is going to replace this guy. Remember him? Marcus Welby. In fact, I, <laughs> I presented this to, uh, not this speech, but I, I used this slide to a group of kids in Princeton. And they were talking to him. They looked at me like I had lobsters growing out of my ears. They didn't know who this guy was. In fact, they made fun of my age. They found out who I, I was. They said, quick Q&A. And they said, Mr. Mosley, we want to ask a question. I said, good. I said, is it really true that Paul McCartney was in a group before Wings, right? <laughs> but this, let's go back to this. And this is, this I take great umbrage with. This show was fantastic. It was all about how doctors are in America. Great show. You went there, you were fixed. Your family was fixed. Your kids were fixed. When you got home, your yard was landscaped. Everything was perfect on the show, remember? <laughs> okay. But in 40 years, we went from this to this. How did we get there? We have to start sticking up for ourselves. And again, anybody know what the show was really originally named? It's house, right, but the show was originally named Chasing Zebras, Circling the Drain. Chasing Zebras, we know the term. Circling the Drain, End of Life Care. They wanted to show how well we did things in America, how, we, how, how long our patients lived, but some writer got a hold of it and said, let's show how fallible our doctors are. What a mistake. He is a great doctor, we admit. He's got a little problem with drugs, right? A little bit light on patient rapport, right? Hospital manners. But this wasn't right. So we have to get back to this guy, okay? And again, time will tell, but nobody's won that $10 million prize yet. We need you, the doctor, okay? One thing I like to say in closing, keep a kind thought for our service personnel, both here and abroad, take care of us every day. And want to say one other thing. This, is, this uh, presentation today, this whole meeting, is so important to what we do, and I know what you do, but Abraham Lincoln said it the best. He had so many great quotes. But he said, if you really want to test a man or a woman, or he said, test who they are, he said, every man and woman can stand up to adversity, but if you really want to test the character of a man and a woman, give them power. The power's with you. I thank you for your time today. Let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. That's for uh, question and answer. So if anybody uh, here with us at Keystone Resort in Colorado has any uh, questions, by all means, come up to the microphone. I imagine you take just about any question except what is your real age? Yes. OK. 63. <laughs> Good for you. I was speaking in terms of Dr. Mike Roizen's realage.com as what you are on the inside well, by virtue of. Uh, my dad always used to say, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? Oh, so. there you go. Questions? So tell us from your perspective, um, with all of the legislation and things, uh, what's been the issue uh, as far as uh, physicians being hired? Because job satisfaction goes to zero when somebody tells you what to do right. when you believe you know what to do. Well, that's the uh, think about, like I said before, Medicare and Medicaid and the Health Security Act were insurance bills, but they didn't ever. In fact, the, if you look on Medicare and Medicaid, there's a uh, paragraph I saw that said, in no way will any government official ever tell a physician how to practice, how they should treat a patient, what they should do and not right. do. That's, but the, health, uh, the ACA does. And I think uh, the rage toward employment, many doctors... Well, 1965's Medicare was a step, was, right. was, a, was an initial step in that. Yeah, and again, it was just, it was great, but then as we move forward, it, got, it went the other way. As a matter of fact, you bring up a great point, Medicare is one-tenth the size in pages that the ACA is, so what we took care of.
Dr. Swelling? Thank you. So just an interesting thing, in the 1965 Medicare Act, it actually does say that they will never interfere with our ability to practice medicine. That was, that was the only reason time. that exactly. any, any physicians or the AMA were come <clears throat> with it to exactly. begin Exactly. Absolutely. So I'd like to challenge just one of the things that you said, and, and, and thank you for everything, Mr. Mosley. I know you well. We were at the AAPP together. So I'm having a hard time hearing. Can I go over here? So I'm sorry. Okay. I, I can uh, trade with you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Right. No, I'm sure. Sorry. Absolutely. So my question is this: Your supposition that we need more specialists. I would like to look at it a little bit differently. If we allow doctors to do what they want to do, particularly in the primary care field, where, where of course we've had a huge exodus, if we allow doctors to do that through concierge medicine, which is what I do, as you know, I think that a lot of doctors will actually come back to concierge medicine. One of the problems that we have is that everybody gets nickel and dimed. So the idea that we don't do casting, we don't do stitches, etc., is because we've been nickel and dimed. In concierge medicine, we do do those things. So quite frankly, I think that many specialists will come back to primary care medicine and a lot and of course if I do my job well it will allow the specialist to do his job better in less time etc so we will not need more specialists as a, on the contrary we will need less specialists right well I mean if you see, if you go back to our history if you go back to 1959 there was a uh, article about the doctor shortage and then there was an overage if you remember right uh -huh. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't want to forget this, in uh, New Yorker magazine, there was a joke in there in the, I guess it was the mid-90s when we kind of thought we'd overshot the moon. Uh, AAMC said we're going to be 100,000 too many, and the big joke was, what do you do when a radiologist knocks at your door? You pay for the pizza? Okay. <laughs> we made a mistake. The AAMC now reversed itself and said we don't, we're not going to have 131,000 too few, but we're going to have 90,000 too few. Of those 90,000, 30,000 are primary care, 66,000 are specialists. So as our specialists get older and retire, but again, the core is, and I agree with you, the core is our primary care delivery system. Exactly. If we do that better, I think we'll have patients taking care of one yeah, place. Yeah, absolutely. The students aren't going into primary care, though, in a lot of the schools because it's been sort of a specialty-driven uh, procedural race. Um, I talked to this, uh, I won't say his name, uh, faculty advisor, and uh, I challenged him one time. He was talking to us. Uh, a doctor that wanted to be in primary care and said, you're way too smart for primary care, and we have to get away from that bias. We have to get away from that. Pro the good news is primary care matched at the highest rate ever this July, but let's not, and I'm not saying right or wrong, but 49% of those were I am international medical graduates. And as we expand, the more numbers that we talk about, it could be across the board, but we have had the Resident Physician Shortage Reduction Act of 2015. You might have heard of the Residency Physician Shortage Reduction Act of 2013. 11, 9, and 7. No movement has been because people said the ACA indicated we don't need more doctors, but we do, and we need them in all areas as we get older. 10,000 people qualified for Medicare today in America. So Exactly. And just a fact, it, on average, a patient will see two specialists per year coming out of a concierge, concierge primary care sure. office. They see 12 in the regular medicine. So there's data to support this. So again, let's encourage primary care. 